There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is the force. These are the words we have spoken for millennia. The words that have guided the Jedi and enraged the Sith for generations. Is it a truth, universal and timeless? Or an anchor to a bygone era? An incomplete understanding of the Force? It is ancient wisdom, yes. And there is no shame in learning from ancient wisdom. But there is a difference between learning from it and being beholden to it, chained to it. There is teaching and there is dogma. And if a wisdom cannot travel with you, more often than not it will betray you and make you less than you were before. A lesson half taught can be as dangerous as a lesson never learned. It all depends on why one stopped learning. If you felt your knowledge was complete, then your ignorance is the most dangerous weapon in the universe, and one you will never be able to control. Did that sound good? That felt convincing. I'm working on it. I have to present to the other masters soon. I would like to sound suitably pretentious in front of them, but I can't always get the tone quite right. It's a difficult thing for me. Well, the Jedi Code is an interesting subject, is it not? Many debate whether or not we have broken sufficiently from it, and the dogma that failed the original Order. It's interesting, isn't it? The Jedi Order has fallen so many times, yet it always comes back. People credit the Sith with being resilient. So few say the same of the Jedi. But I suppose that does make sense. The mission of the kind is never complete. The mission of the cruel... Well, that is never complete either. But it is felt very, very keenly. The Jedi Code is etched into every wall of this temple. Honestly, the interior decor suffers for it, I think, but that's not why I brought you here. I want you to have a look at this. After the Battle of Endor and the fall of the second Death Star, these words were found all over the Republic, graffitied onto walls, attached to official communiques, hidden in every nook and cranny of it. Interesting that these words became so public, after all, who held to them, seemed to fall. I would like you to read the words. Just read them. That's all I want. Just for you to read them. Do nothing more, and think nothing else. No? Very well. That's all right. I shall do it for you. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion I gain strength. Through strength I gain power. Through power I gain victory. Through victory my chains are broken, and the Force shall free me. It's alright. It's alright. It's alright. Hey, hey! They're just words. They are mere words. They have no power here. They cannot harm us. They cannot harm you. These are the words of the Sith. But words are not their power. They never really have been. I want you to read them because I want you to understand them. To understand why they might hold appeal. Why the Sith cling to them so tightly. Let's start with the first. Peace is a lie. What does that mean? 
true, a Sith rarely thrives when things are tranquil and still. However, there is more to it, I think. When peace is a lie, nothing can stop you. Nothing will stunt your progress. There is no order to the universe, no balance to the Force. Then all life is just primal instinct and urges. You can enact those instincts, revel in those instincts. Have your whims and desires manifest on a galactic scale. And once you embrace that, you can achieve anything. The entire universe can be yours. Any desire you have ever had, any luxury you have always yearned for, any world that has wronged you, any person you wish to dominate or punish, you can. You can build your strength, allow your will to dominate others, kill them, break them, win any engagement, do what you want at any cost. Perhaps what you want is even moral, is even good. Who knows better than you what is best for everybody else? You see the world in a unique way. You can see the wrong in it. If you see injustice, you can wipe it out. If you see a world that is a cancer at the heart of the Republic, you can break it upon your will and remake it into something better. Do you see the appeal in such words, student? Good. Would you embrace such a philosophy? No? Good. Because neither would I. The Sith see the universe as a brutal and terrible place, and as such, they have free license to do whatever they can and whatever they wish to get ahead in it. If there is no good in the universe, then what's the harm? Everyone will betray them eventually. Why not get ahead? The universe is not cruel, it is not evil. It is not good or virtuous. It simply is. It has its brutality and its horror, but it has its wonders and its joys. It is what we make of it. Not just how we see it, no, but what we do with it. The Sith see an opportunity for personal domination. The Jedi have always tried to help people. I consider the second to be a worthy goal, and the first to be a waste of time and resources and life. I have little time for the Sith who would use the cruelties of the universe as an excuse to feed their gross appetites. What is the point of life, if it is just to make others suffer? What is advanced by that? We amass all this knowledge and wisdom and power, and if that is all we use it for, then we have made the universe smaller, and poorer, and greyer. We dull its wonders, we steal its riches, and we cheapen what it is with pointless cruelty. Emperor Palpatine. What a waste of a life. He was a staggering intellect. He played the system like nobody before him or after him. He had unprecedented authority and power over the universe, and he did nothing with it. There was no wisdom in that man. Only nihilism and selfishness masquerading as knowledge. He could have been so much more, but instead he climbed the rungs of the corrupt republic, looked upon that corruption and thought it good. He did not try to change it. He had every opportunity. He had the universe in his grasp, and all he did was tighten it until it slipped through his fingers. He could have been so much more. You okay? You've backed away from me. I am speaking very harshly today. I apologize for that. 
Yes, you're right, this is a test. But I'm not presenting it very well, and for that, I apologize. This is training. You need to be sure in your convictions. Just as you would test muscle to strengthen it, or you meditate to connect to the Force, the same is also true of belief. If you are unwilling to test your faith, to expose it to opposition, new ideas, it will remain weak, and when subjected to strain, it will falter and break. You have faced the same fears as the Sith. The loss of control, the loss of power, the loss of respect. But you overcame those fears. You work to overcome them. You feel as though you have lost your way in the world, and yet you endure. That is why I brought you here. Because like I said, after the death of Emperor Palpatine, these words, and others like them, started to appear all over the galaxy. The echoes of this dead religion. Trying to ensure that the Sith legacy would live on. These words inspired many. Many that the Jedi failed to. I saw it myself. On Val Noctera. I never told you where I came from, did I? Let me tell you a story. Once, there was a group of slaves. The possessions of a Zigerian crime lord known as Jalzar Lok. He was a cruel, abusive master. A sickening parasite. We hated him. But he was influential on Val Noctera. There was little industry on that world, its agriculture was humble, able to sustain itself, but made little impact on the galaxy as a whole. But the one asset it could provide in abundance was people. Slaves. Many would import the people of Val Noctera, use them for labor. And Jalzar Lok was all too happy to provide that asset. There was rebellion, defiance. Every so often we would see slogans scrawled on the walls or riots break out in the street. They were pacified. They were always pacified. Some even called on the Jedi to intervene, and they promised they would once they had rebuilt their strength, once they had the opportunity to do so. Once the threat had been evaluated, but we were running out of time. Jalzar was going to sell us off. Jalzar was going to inflict unspeakable cruelties on people we knew and people we loved, and we weren't about to wait, and what we were offered as... consolation in those dark times were more words. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no passion, there is serenity, and on and on it went. These words meant little, and moved no one. Without emotion there is no anger, without anger there is no outrage, and without outrage there is no action. If the will of the light side of the Force was for everything to stay the same, for all to be at peace, why should we embrace it? good was that for a slave? One day we found the Sith words, and these were much more inspiring. Our chains be broken through the Force. Our will be felt at long last. A long ignored voice would echo with the strength of the Force across the galaxy itself. One by one, those I knew embraced the teachings. They were but Mama's Sith, using the dark side, embracing it, but knowing nothing of it, of its risks or its corruption. They saw power and they took it. A Jedi would tell them that they took the wrong path, they took a shortcut. But when you're a slave, when you are faced with evil, should action not be decisive? 
I cannot claim that anyone was wrong for embracing those teachings when they did. I cannot say they were wrong when they took up arms, when they first built what they thought were lightsabers. I cannot say they were wrong when they killed Jalzar Lok. I cannot say they were wrong when they rose up against Jalzar's supporters. I cannot even say they were wrong when they slew them and took power for themselves. That was not when they betrayed us. The Chain, they called themselves, and they now controlled Val Noctera. Passion breaks, chains, wins, victory, but it does little else. The Dark Side teaches you how to defeat your enemies, but it does not tell you what to do with the victory. Did we know how to build bridges? How to sow fields? Find water, drain sewage, build a functioning economy, make allies? No, of course not. The Sith do not teach these things. The Sith never appreciate the value of labor, because the Sith do not appreciate the value of anything they do not wish to do themselves. It's beneath them. I saw a teacher ask his acolyte to clean his room once, and the acolyte almost fought that teacher to the death. It would almost have been funny, but it spoke to a deeper problem. My friends were unwilling to do the work. They had no desire to. Their chains were broken, and to them that was enough. So they simply did what all cowards do when given power. They said this is the way things are, the way the galaxy works. So they took control and changed nothing and the people's chains were left unbroken. So now what do we do? We trade one villain for another, and these ones have force powers, and at this point we're getting a little closer to the secret of how to construct a lightsaber. And now they were calling themselves Sith, seeking out their teachings wherever they could, making trades and acquiring true power. Well, that got the attention of the Jedi, and how intriguing it was. The Jedi responded so quickly to the chain, the moment the word Sith was mentioned. No, I don't blame them. It makes sense, to be honest. They were a far more dangerous threat than Jalza was. That kind of power has to be challenged before it can grow. Jalzar was never changing. He was cruel, but he was consistent. But the Sith? Well, the Sith are capable of anything. They would have been. The problem is, these people were not Sith. Once the Jedi arrived, the people rebelled. <laughs> the Chain were willing enough to fall into factional infighting. Started blaming each other, betraying each other. They were... Isolated, incarcerated, and forgotten, especially since the Jedi always seemed to know where to strike them. Exactly where they were hiding. Funny that, isn't it? Almost as if somebody told them. But things had to be better now, right? On Val Noctera? The Jedi had arrived. All was safe. But as I mentioned before, these Jedi were not truly ready to solve the problems on Val Noctera. Killing an adversary is one thing, but trying to save a world? Should the Jedi intervene? They were asked to on this occasion. But how far should their intervention go? The chain had destroyed the previous government. They'd have to build the new one from scratch. And the people of Val Noctera were not ready for that. They'd need protection. They'd need help. And only the Jedi thus far had been powerful enough to rally the people. So what could they do? Well, as always, the Jedi turned to the Force. Clearly it had led them there. And this world was breeding Sith. Something had to be done. And they were the only ones who could do it. So the Jedi 
took control of Valmok Terra for a time. These young ones. Fresh initiates, neophytes, really. Became the provisional government of an entire world. Until new elections could be held. But that took time. And these young Jedi grew used to the world. They came to care for its people. Some of them even ran for office. And the moment they did, well, was it a surprise to anyone when they won? Things were better under the Jedi. I don't want you to think that the Jedi were monsters from the off. The chain weren't at first. It was only after years of difficulty that they decided to fall. Now we have a group of young Jedi, more powerful than any asset Valnoctera could bring against them. They were filled with self-righteous zeal and up till now had a clear definition of what evil was. And an evil man is easy enough to kill when you have a lightsaber, but her thoughts away from your hand. At first, they offered reasonable solutions. They redistributed resources and fed the people. Some of us tried to reach out with the Force to find wellsprings, new sources of food and water, to find problems and rebuild this world. The common folk adored them. The ecology recovered after years of abuse. But then we watched a quiet invasion take place. Because the Jedi did not just offer physical solutions, but spiritual ones as well. Nothing had replaced the slave economy. The Jedi were mistrustful of allies that were not pure of heart, so they turned them away. They made amateur mistakes in government. Sometimes they simply failed. These young Jedi without guidance, without any experience in such matters, well, they lost their way. Not all the citizens were content. And to settle their fears, the Jedi offered spiritual solutions. Tried to teach them to embrace the Force. A world filled with Jedi. If not masters of the Force, then at very least loyal acolytes. How could this not be a benefit to the galaxy? How could this not be of benefit to the Order? If we could heal an entire world with our teachings, were we not truly better than the Sith? But the trouble was, not everyone agrees with the Jedi teachings. Not everyone believes in their code. People took convincing. And perhaps the most insidious thing about the Jedi is that when you need convincing, the Force has a trick for that. Dissidents who wanted to embrace their appetites, teachers who disagreed with the history the Jedi presented, parents who did not want their children to be ripped from their homes for showing a spark of talent. Well, these people were convinced of the righteousness of the Jedi theocracy. There was a singer there that I was very fond of. There was an almost primal beauty about her. Tapped into some elemental part of us. She made us dance like nothing else. She made us feel like nothing else. She was dazzling. But the theocracy were concerned that her presentation was too much like the chains, like the Sith they had just removed. And I watched this beautiful soul become muted and monochrome, dulled and sapped and drained, until all that was left was the shell. She was just as content in a bureaucracy as on stage from that point on. 
and I watch so many others, rebels, dissidents with proud, confident voices, passion, suddenly have it leached in the name of peace and conformity. Oh, nobody died. Nobody was killed. No one was harmed. No one was tortured. No. Jedi atrocity is far more subtle than that. This was the work of the Jedi theocracy. The work of children so convinced they were right. They would drag everyone down with them. So they had to be stopped. How do you think? There were very few dissenters then. Few could resist their control. And the Jedi are good at sensing feelings of distrust, of anger. Few could hide those feelings, especially from the Jedi. But there was one man. A man who had been trained under two regimes. A man who had already betrayed one of them when they walked away from the ideals he taught them. So this man became a traitor once again. He struck the theocracy where it was weak, called down the true Jedi, and the theocracy began to collapse. Those that survived were excommunicated, and those that clung to power he removed. It took a long time, and it was a bloody business. But the theocracy was destroyed. And that man was granted redemption. Oh, come on. You don't need me to say his name. <laughs> It's doing better now, you know. Val Nocturna. The Jedi forbade themselves from setting foot there, and the people were all too happy to agree with that. But I check in from time to time. I help rebuild with my hands. Occasional advice, but never the force. They trust me. <laughs> they trust me. Me. I was never a Sith Lord, but while I was with the chain, we, uh, we helped ourselves to some of their names. Made us feel big, made us feel powerful. We had a Vader, we had a Malgus, we even had a Bane. But mine, <laughs> mine was Treya. Because there must always be a Darth Treya. The galaxy needs its betrayers. Without them, there is no hope. I've never believed that. It's not in betrayal that hope is found, but in the promise of something new. You know what it's like to fall, and you were brave enough to admit that you had. And so many would have given up, would have betrayed themselves, but not you, not you. You got up, and you worked, you worked, and I look at you now, and I, I am proud. I am proud of who you're becoming. I don't always believe in myself, my student, but you. You I have never had anything but absolute faith in. 
I'll be fine. It's getting dark. You should go. I'll, uh, I'll be fine. You stay. Okay. Five more minutes. I'll hate myself for five more minutes. And then we get back to work. 